Let's take our Bibles, and this morning we're going to be uh, going a lot of places. Open them to Isaiah 41. And if you're new at this, in fact, I got a note on the back of an offering envelope. Someone put it in the offering plate, and they said, why don't you just give us page numbers? I can't find that. And I said, okay. Um, You just open the middle like this, and you should hit the Psalms, and then go to the right. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah. And Isaiah is so big, 66 chapters, you can't miss it uh, if you're going from the middle to the right. This morning, the context of what we're doing is we're looking at Revelation 4 and 5 in the larger picture. Uh, The series we're on is the throne room of the universe, which is described in Revelation 4 and 5. But much like one page torn out of a map, it's part of something much bigger. Uh, When I used to travel to conferences before, you know, iPhones and GPS and all that stuff, uh, instead of packing into my bag the giant AAA atlas, Bonnie used to just find the page where I was speaking, she'd tear it out of the atlas, and I'd fold it all up and it was just, didn't take up any space at all. I'm afraid a lot of people kind of have favorite chapters in the Bible, kind of like torn out pages, and they don't realize that they're all connected. In other words, most people, Christians of any denomination, would think Revelation 21, 22 is good. I mean, that's heaven. We all agree on that. And they would think Revelation 4 and 5, where we're going to be in a little while, heaven, good. Now, Revelation 1, 2 and 3, not sure that applies to us, and they get squeamish if you say that Jesus was speaking to all churches of all time, and they kind of, you know, And then you get into 6 through 20, and they just throw up their hands and say, "Uh uh-uh, can't understand that, just leave it alone. They're all torn out of the same map. And the same God wrote down the same truths that are all to be understood in the same way. And so this morning, I just want to remind you that right here in Revelation 4 and 5, that that everyone just harmonizes with, you know, we're all going to be bowing before the Lamb and all that. The same God that says we're going to do that says an awful lot of stuff on both sides of those chapters that are equally vital for our lives. A map of the future that God left us in his word. God wrote down an inspired record of history for this world. Now, did you catch that? God wrote in this book the history of the world from 95 A.D. to the end until eternity swallows up our mortality. You understand that? This book, especially the last book of this book, by the way, Bible is just Latin, biblos, which means books, uh, or book. Uh, This was just called the book. That's what Bible means, it means book. And there are many Bibles. There have been many Bibles throughout all of history, but this is the book of books. And this book, the last book of it, Revelation, is God's map. Now, if you see a map and you see, you know, something that's shaped like uh, that, you know, you know where Michigan is on the map of the United States. And so if you saw something that was shaped like that, you would know it was not a map that you recognize. The scriptures tell us that what we see on this map are given by God to guide us. In fact, the whole book of Revelation was given to God's servants so that they would know the things that are going to happen between 95 A.D., and when we're all in heaven. All of the redeemed of all the ages are there. So that inspired record is, is a, an amazing truth that we hold that a lot of us don't realize what it's supposed to do for us. Now, you know, the, the online world mourned something this week. One of the last icons of the old pre-cyber world bit the dust this week. Do you all know what it was? After 244 years, the Encyclopedia Britannica no longer is going to be printed. 244 years, an uh, an amazing compendium of all of the history of civilization and all the knowledge and thoughts, no longer going to be printed. They stopped this week. Well, you know what? The, the, The world was mourning this. I remember in the library, it used to just take about six feet of shelf space but you know what? Every year they had to re-edit it. They, every time something new stone was dug up, they had to re-put in a new article that corrected it, and all the science things were, you ought to read a 244-year-old Encyclopedia Britannica article about anything in science. It's funny. This is history written in advance. Did you catch that history? 
God has told the actual events with names and places and details and and geographic locations that no one else but God could write. And that's my premise to you this morning. Uh, the, by the way, the website for Encyclopedia Britannica, have you ever been there? You know what it says? It says, facts matter. Their, their premise is they publish that compendium because facts matter. Do you know who facts matter the most to? To God. He's the God of truth. And God always gives the facts. Do you remember a few weeks ago we were looking at how the, we know the Bible is true, our, our Sunday night apologetic series, and I told you that there are seven reasons why you can trust the Bible. Do you remember what the fourth one was? I'll read it to you. I, I copied it. The fourth reason we should trust God's word was fulfilled prophecy. And here's the byline for that. It is the simplest and, yes, most profound evidence that the Bible offers. God actually used prophecy as evidence that he offers. It's almost like in a courtroom setting. And we're going to see that in Isaiah 41. God says, okay, you present your case, I'll present mine. Look at both of them and decide. Prophecy is the way that God presents his case. You know why? Nobody else can tell the future. Prophecy is the missing element in every sacred scripture of all the world's religions. It is not to be found in the Muslim's Quran. There is not prophecy, detailed events that are spelled out geographically and historically and politically and economically into the future. It is not found in the sayings of Buddha. There is no prophecy in the Hindu's scriptures. In fact, in the Mormon's book, There is no prophecy. In fact, there's nothing that can be verified in the Book of Mormon. No geographic entry in there ever has been verified, ever. So, I mean, that's why if you can't even verify the geography, watch out for prophecy. But by contrast, prophecy makes up a third of the Bible. A third. Everybody else, none. God, a third of this book. That's a significant investment. And prophecy is described by God, starting in Isaiah 41, 21, as the clearest and most remarkable way to verify who's who out there among the world religions. So let me just give you these six quick, in fact, um, there are many places you could study eschatological or eschatology or prophetic passages, but Isaiah, starting in chapter 41, has, it's almost like a cluster. It's a mother load of God. It, it's the setting, and if you want to understand, always know the context. Don't just dive in the Bible. Um, what's the context? Israel is sliding. Israel, the chosen people of promise of God, were, were brought out of Egypt, were called by God at the mount. A covenant was made with them, and they started sliding from then on away from the God who said, don't worship false gods, don't have any graven images. And by the time you get to Isaiah, they are torn, literally, moment by moment, between idols and the true and living God. All their neighbors, I mean, flaunted their little idols. They had them. They had them in their house. They had them everywhere. They carried them with them. And their gods you could see. In Israel, their God was invisible. In fact, they'd even ask the priest, they said, when you go in the tent, do you see anything in there? And they go, no, no, don't see them. Oh. And all their neighbors would show off their idol, and they had them around the house and in their yard and in their groves, and the Israelites had nothing. And so they slowly were going after having an idol, having a physical representation to bow down before, to put little offerings in front of, and to ask for favors from. And God says, don't do that. Don't go that route. And so this is where he starts in chapter 41, starting in verse 21. So that's the context. And prophecy, first of all, is God's unique distinctive. This is what makes him God. This is what he says, verse 21. Present your case. Do you see the courtroom setting? Present your case, says the Lord. Bring forth your strong reason, says the king of Jacob. Let them bring forth and show us what will happen. You see, the, 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 the first time God brings this up, he just says, hey, let them prove who they are. I'll show who I am. And the way I'll show who I am is, see if they can tell the future. My distinctive that shows I'm the real God is only I 
know in advance what's going to happen. Let them show us, verse 21 says, what, or verse 22 says, what will happen. Let them show the former things, what they were, that we may consider them, and now look at the end of the verse, and know the latter end of them, or declare to us, here it is, things to come. God says, my unique distinctive is, I can tell you in the past, in detail, what's going to come in the future. And nobody else knows that. And he says, I'll even write it down so you can verify it. Number one, prophecy is God's unique distinctive. Number two, look at chapter 42, verses 8 and 9. And you might want to mark these. These are great for, uh, for understanding how we know the Bible is true. Number two, prophecy is a demonstration of God's glory. Every time that what God says comes true, it's a demonstration of his glorious power. I mean, the fact that David, a thousand years before the cross, described Christ being hung on a cross with all of his bones showing and the thirst and all that was going on on the cross in Psalm 22, when it, when it took place, exactly as David wrote, a thousand years before, it was bringing glory to the God who alone knew the future and could describe how Christ would die. He would not be hung, he would not be stoned, he would not be run through, you know, with, with uh, uh, a sword. Uh, he would be hung and bleed to death on a cross, just like Psalm 22 says. It demonstrates God's glory. But look at verse 8 of Isaiah 42. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise, and see the context here, nor my praise to what? Carved images. See, that's the context of this contest was between, much like uh, what was going on with Elijah and the prophets of Baal. Baal was another one of these carved images that, that was a false idol. So the Lord says, I'm not going to give my praise to a carved image. Verse 9, behold, the former things have come to pass. In other words, everything I've already told you is going to happen has happened. And new things I declare before they spring forth, I tell you of them. He says, I haven't just told you what was going to happen in the past. I am going to continue telling you what is going to happen in the future. Now, he says, everything I promised you that was going to happen, and in the past I promised them and you've seen them happen, I'm going to keep on doing that and show you things to come. Prophecy is a demonstration of God's glory. Look at chapter 44, verses 6 and 7, because prophecy is the acid test of, of deity. Now, I remember uh, when, remember when gold first spiked and uh, everybody started cleaning out their jewelry boxes and finding grandma's ring, you know, and they wanted to see if it was real gold and they were selling it because it was so, you know, so much money they could get. And, and people went to the coin shops with all these heirlooms that were now priceless because of the gold content. And the, the person checking for gold would look at them and say, now, you know I'm going to drip acid on this, and if it's not really made of gold, it's just going to go, pfft. it's going to ruin Grandma's ring. And I don't think it's gold, but if you want me to try it, I'm going to give it the acid test. Now, you see, that was, that was for the person a decision point whether they really want their, what they think is gold proven to be or not to be. Well, that's what the Lord says right here in chapter 44. He says, you want the acid test of deity? Verse 6, thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and I am the last. And beside me, besides me, there is no God. Now, as I read verse 6, did you, did you hear a little bit from Revelation 1? I am the first and the last. Remember I told you that the foundation of the New Testament is the Old Testament? And the New Testament almost expects that you have a knowledge that there's a foundation under the New Testament that's the Old Testament. And that's why you find over 800 allusions to the foundation, the other books of Scripture, in the book of Revelation. This is just one of them, the first and the last. When Jesus calls himself that, he's affirming the Trinity because he as well as the Father, is the first and the last. And look what he says. Beside me, there's no, no God. He says, there, there aren't a God, like the Jehovah's Witnesses would say, you know, that Jesus is a God, and there's God, and there's a God, you know, the little one and the big one. Jesus said, no, I'm not a God. I am the God, and I am the eternal God. I, I 
as he says here, I am the one who is the first and the last. But, but look what else he says, verse 7. And who can proclaim as I do? Let him declare it and set it in order for me. Verse 7, since I appointed ancient people. Now here's the acid test. And the things that are coming and shall come, let them show these to them. What he's saying is he's saying, okay, come on, stick your ring there and let's put the acid on. Let's see who's the real thing. The real thing can tell the future, and that's me, the living and true God. The acid test of deity is the ability to declare the future. Uh, verse uh, 21 of chapter 45, just turn the page there to Isaiah 45, verse 21. We're going to come back to this chapter because not only is this chapter from the prophetic nature, it also has probably the single most astounding prophecy in the Bible that, that you can just see God's ability to tell the future. But look at verse 21. Uh, prophecy is a verifiable proof of God's power. In verse 21, tell and bring forth your case. Let them take counsel together. Who has declared this from ancient time? Who has told it from that time? Have not I, the Lord? He says, I'm the one that's powerful. There's no God besides me. I'm a just God and a Savior. There's no one besides me. He says, if I can declare from ancient times the future, then I am the verifiable God of power. I am the real thing. And you can verify it. That's why prophecy is in the Bible. It's, it's in the Bible not to kind of push off to the side because it's embarrassing, because it doesn't agree with our preconceived notions. It's there to verify the power of the God who declares in advance what will happen. Next, look at chapter 46, verse 10. Prophecy is literally history written in advance. This is what he says in verse 10. Declaring the end from the beginning... The book of Revelation declares the end. And it goes back to the beginning. The book of Revelation chapter 12 is the only place in the Bible that connects all the pieces. It tells us that the serpent that tempted Eve in the garden is the same one who was the covering anointed cherub, is the same one that's Satan that's dogging at Christ's heels all through his ministry. And he is the adversary. And it's, it goes back to the beginning and it declares the end. And God says, he says, prophecy is history written in advance. I declare, from the end, I declare the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done. Look at the end of verse 10 of chapter 46. Saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Now the interesting thing about Bible prophecy is it's not speculative. It's God telling us what he's going to do. It's not just he's hoping it's going to happen. He's going to do it. God is actually watching over his word, and he is going to do it. In fact, did you know the Bible describes what we see little glimmerings of right now going on? You know, we have, what, 25,000 Navy sailors that are floating off the coast of Iran right now, you know? That's four aircraft carriers full of boys. And, and you know what the Bible says? The Bible says that God is going to put hooks in the jaws of the northern nation. The nation, God says, just look at a map. Whichever nation goes to the, the furthest ocean in the world, what's the, the most northern ocean in the world from geography class? It's called the Arctic Ocean. And he said, the nation that is north of Israel that, that butts up against the, the furthest sea he said, I'm going to put hooks in their jaws, Ezekiel 38, and I'm going to pull them down toward Jerusalem. And he said, I'm not just going to send them alone. I'm going to put hooks in the jaws of the Persian, Iranians, and I'm going to pull them down too. And you know what? God says, I've decided this. I'm going to make it happen. I am the one, Isaiah 46, 10, who have written history in advance. My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Now look at chapter 48. Here's the last one. And, and these are, I used to teach eschatology in seminary, and I have to say, enough is enough, you know, don't keep going, but here's one last one. 
Isaiah 48, verse 3. Prophecy is to confirm that God can be trusted. Prophecy is not to make pretty charts and, you know, for Hal Lindsey to sell 35 million books or for, you know, the accordion player from uh, Detroit, I forget his name, the walking Bible man, Van Empey, to sell records. It is for us to trust. I mean, they can do all that, and it's good to, to have Christian materials, but that isn't why it was written. It was written to make us trust God. And, and what he, look what he says in chapter 48. I have declared, verse 3 of Isaiah 48, I have declared the former things from the beginning. They went forth from my mouth. I caused them to hear it. Suddenly I did them, and they came to pass. Do you understand God is actively engaged bringing what his word says to pass? Now, in the New Testament, I hope that gives you great comfort. If the Lord says that, that he will give us his perfect peace, that if he said that, that he would help us to be led in victory, he's going to accomplish that in us too. Just like he's going to put hooks in the jaws of the northernmost nation and bring them down, he can also cause us to go forth in triumph in our overcoming sin in our lives. So prophecy helps us to confirm God as he can be trusted. Look at verse 4. Because I knew you were obstinate, and your neck was iron sinew, and your brow bronze, even from the beginning I declared it to you. Before it came to pass, I proclaimed it to you, lest you should say my idol has done that, my carved image and my molded image have made that happen. You see, prophecy is to make us trust God. Now for a moment, I want you to go back to Isaiah 45, 1. So back up from... 48 to 45, 1. Because I want to show you what, what I call one of the most astounding biblical prophecies. In verse 1, a person is named. And is named as Cyrus. Now, Cyrus is an identifiable person in history. In fact, if you just type it into Google, the first article comes up, Cyrus the Great, and it tells you his whole history. He's mentioned in the Bible in 2 Chronicles 36. He's mentioned in Ezra chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4. He's mentioned in Daniel chapter 1 and chapter 10. Basically, Cyrus was the ruler of Persia. He's the one that followed Darius. Do you remember Darius the Mede and then Cyrus? And he was the one that came around after the Babylonians were conquered and all that. Well, there's nothing amazing about chapter 45, verse 1. Thus says the Lord to his anointed to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held to subdue nations, to loose armor of kings, and on and on. There's nothing amazing about that except for this. When did Isaiah write those words? Well, you all can do a personal Bible study. Go back to chapter 6 because the date for the book of Isaiah is self-contained. You don't need to buy an encyclopedia to get it. It's in the Bible. It says in Isaiah 6, we covered it about three weeks ago, this is when Isaiah began his, his ministry. So we can date when Isaiah wrote those words in Isaiah 45. And it says in Isaiah 6, in the year that King Uzziah died. Now there's a historically verifiable date in history. Do you know when he died? If you look up in the encyclopedia, it was somewhere around the year 739 BC. So just think, 700. Now here's the cross and back up eight centuries before Christ, B.C., before Christ, 739 years before Christ. So zero, the cross of Christ, and then A.D. goes that way. 739 years back, Isaiah is alive. Now we know that was just the beginning of his ministry. He prophesied until about 680 B.C. So he prophesied for about, you know, 50, 60 years or more. But this 739 is when this was happening. Now go back to Isaiah 45. When did Cyrus live? Isaiah names him about 739 B.C. Well, the event that's mentioned in Isaiah 45, get it, happened in 539 B.C. Did you see how many steps I took? 200 years. That means Isaiah named a person in the future 200 years before the event, before about 160 years before they were born. He names them. Now, just put this in perspective, and I, I told Bonnie, I said, I was having fun doing this. 
let's just put it in perspective. Do you know what happened in March of this year? March 4th, a big event. Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin became the president of Russia. He was elected March 4th. What would you have thought of someone predicting that 200 years ago? Now, who was alive 200 years ago that's a Christian that we could trust? Well, there are three famous ones that were alive in 1812. Do you know they, who they are? George Mueller, remember the orphanage guy? He was alive. How about William Carey, the father of modern missions? He was alive. Um, Adoniram Judson, the first greatest American missionary to Burma. Those three men were godly recognized students of the word. What would you think if those three men said, God told us Vladimir Putin will be the president of Russia? People would look and say Russia doesn't even have presidents. You know, they have czars, Catherine, you know, and all that going on in history. How do you know that? We don't believe it. And did you know for 200 years, the prophecy of Isaiah sat there and people just said, this is ridiculous. Cyrus who? Until 539 B.C. And he ascended, took over, and allowed Israel to come back to build the temple and, and to set up their gates. And Cyrus decreed, you can read it in 2 Chronicles 36, and Ezra 1 through 4 is all about it. But what we don't do in our mind is we don't do the math. We do... God predicted by name an individual in the future. Do you know what liberals do? Do you know what a liberal is, theologically speaking? A liberal is someone that doesn't believe this book is inspired. They don't believe the miracles really happened. They don't believe Jesus is really God, and he certainly didn't walk on the water, and none of that stuff, you know, it just didn't happen. They don't even believe in the resurrection. They're, they're liberals. And, and, and they call themselves liberal Christians. And the problem I have with that is, the Bible says a Christian is someone who so then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the what? Word of God. Okay, so they say they're a Christian, which is someone that receives the implanted Word of God in their heart that saves them, yet they don't believe it's the Word of God. So how can they be saved? You know, that's a quandary that they have to figure out, not me. But the God who wrote the Bible 200 years before the event in Isaiah 45.1, that's one you can figure out yourself without any education, God predicted precisely the name of the person 200 years before the event. Now, you know what the liberals do? They say, well, Isaiah has two parts. The first 39 chapters, the guy in Isaiah 6 wrote, but these chapters, a guy that lived in the time of Daniel that already had met Cyrus wrote that part. The problem is, if you look at the Isaiah scroll, the one that was written that's in the shrine of the book, there's no break between 39 and 40. It's a continuous. It isn't like two guys wrote it and that the Jews knew about it. There was one Isaiah, but we won't get into that. Uh, let's, let's look now to the book of Revelation chapter 5, and I'm going to give you a quick survey of the map. I want to talk about the map of future events. Remember I said that the Bible is like a map, and a map like the Encyclopedia Britannica, facts matter. God has laid out a map, and he's put points on it. Now, when... when uh, all 10 of us used to fit in one car when we had the kids and they were all different ages. We used to set off to see grandpa or something and we'd be driving in the car and the kids would start moaning after about three minutes, you know, saying, where are we and when are we going to get there? And we would always, Bonnie and I would pass them the atlas and we'd say, it's time for you to have a little map class. And they'd get it open and they'd have it upside down and turn and we'd say, okay, turn it this way. Okay, now look there, that's the whole United States. Now, do you see Michigan? And they could, you know, see it. They'd find it, and I'd say, okay, we're, you know, in California, and so it's over there. And so they could identify points, and sooner or later, they figured out where we were. Did you know the Bible is like a map? We aren't sure where we are. We have to work on that. God has placed facts. He's told us all the events that are going to happen between A.D. 95 and the end. And what we have to figure out is, where are we on the map? So what are the future events God left in his world? And what, what are the, the pinpoints on that map that his word tells us about? Well, number one, the first three chapters of Revelation are about the church. 
And the church, we studied that for weeks. The church is at work. Uh, before his death, Jesus promised he was going to build his church, Matthew 16, 18. His church was born on the day of Pentecost. And the, the church was left here, made up of remnants of Jews and Gentiles who came to trust Christ as their Savior. That's what Ephesians 2 and 3 says. They, they were left here to fulfill the plan. And we're a part of that. And the plan is that we go into all the world and we evangelize and disciple. That's what we're here for. We're supposed to, whether we're right here in in western Michigan or in some other remote part of the world, we're supposed to be a part of leading people to Christ and having them grow in Christ. So make sure you're doing what you were left to do is uh, the word to the church. In addition to discipleship and evangelism, the church was asked to do something. It says in 1 Thessalonians 1.10 as well as Acts 1.8, we're supposed to be waiting for Jesus. Paul told the Philippians, or the Thessalonians, that you wait for the Son who is coming from heaven for you. And so we're supposed to be doing our work, but always expecting the one we're working for to show up. It's kind of like you never know when the boss is going to come, and so you look for him. That's the church. And the church age, Paul says, will close. On the map it says, the way you know the church is coming to a close is there will be global apostasy. What is that? People that claim to be Christians are going to back away from Christianity and they're going to say stuff like, the Bible's not really inspired, Jesus isn't really divine, he didn't rise from the dead. That's become common. In fact, it's, it's, it's scholarly now to deny the Bible. But that isn't all. I mean, they've been denying it all along. Also, Paul says that the whole culture of the world will become obsessed with selfish pursuits, immorality, violence, and it will lead to just a global emptiness. Well, you know what? We're in a time where people are experiencing more freedom than ever in history. And there's more pursuits. And look what's going up. I mean, They're killing everybody in sight in Mexico just so they can get all the drugs to us rich Americans who are buying them all. I mean, it's just we're in this pursuit of filling the emptiness. Well, what ends the church time? It's the catching away, the rapture of the church. The rapture is described in God's word by a word that means to catch away. And do we know what that means? Yeah. Philip once was witnessing to the Ethiopian eunuch, and when he got done leading him to the Lord, it says the Holy Spirit raptured, harpazoed him. What happened to him? What does that mean happen? He left where the Ethiopian eunuch was and he showed up somewhere else. He was was carried away. It's the same word Paul says that he was was taken up to see heaven. Uh, It's the very same word. And so we know what rapture means. It's in the Bible and it says what that means, this sudden moving from where you are to another place is called the rapture. We know what it means and we know where we're going. We are described as meeting Jesus in the air who takes us home, John 14, 6, and this becomes our blessed hope because he has kept us, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, from God's wrath. What is God's wrath? At the height of God's wrath, it's a few weeks ago I shared this with you, it's when he takes the lid off the pit and he allows those horrible creatures that are so vile that he's kept them penned up for thousands of years. And finally, everybody on earth is going to see in person what they've been playing in their video games that's been not true. They're going to see all these horrific monsters, only they're not going to be able to turn the screen off or blow them up with their remote. It's going to be real. And that's what the tribulation is. And that's the blessing that we're not a part of that. But what's the purpose of the tribulation? It is for Israel. The tribulation on earth is the 70th week of Daniel to get Israel to pay attention to their Messiah. Right now, they don't need to pay attention to their Messiah. They're the financiers. They're the musicians. They're the lawyers. They're the doctors. They have more patents and more Nobel Prizes per capita than any other group of people on the planet. They are brilliant. They are gifted. And they are not needing Christ. And so... The Lord in the tribulation gets Israel to finally be completely isolated and this global ruler, the Antichrist, gets everybody on earth against Israel. Now they've always felt that way, but they've always been able to find someone that would protect them until the tribulation and no one protects them. And at the climax of the tribulation, 
when the Antichrist is ready to do the final holocaust, he has cataloged everybody in the world, numbered them all, and he knows exactly where. By the way, did you see that they're putting computer chips now with the new chips into everything? And, and actually, they are going to be able to, to use, you ought to read what the New York Times says, that the CIA can use the reverse processor to actually track uh, everybody where they are. We've already known this, but it was always in Hal Lindsey books. It's now in the New York Times. But through all that process we're seeing form, he's gonna, the Antichrist is going to know where every Jew is. He's got them all penned up. And just as he comes in to annihilate them, Zechariah 12.10 says they go like this. And they, for the first time, the nation says, Messiah, save us. And remember, Jesus said, whoever calls, what? A name of the Lord, what? Will be saved. They're calling on the right one. And the Bible says that the remnant, a third, uh, basically the Antichrist kills off two-thirds of them, and the last third are the ones that say, and the Lord comes, and that's the end of human history, right then, just boom. The Lord, that's Armageddon, that's just boom. He saves the Jews. Much to the dismay of all the liberals who doesn't, don't think that God has any plan for him. It's the center of his plan. And what does Christ do? It's the fourth event, the millennial kingdom. Jesus touches down in, in Jerusalem, and, and those Jews just are clustering around him. They're so excited he saved them. And he sets up the throne of David that was promised at his birth, that he would sit on the throne of David. When has Jesus ever sat on any throne on earth? Never. He's going to sit on a throne and rule. That's the millennial kingdom. For a thousand years, resurrected believers reign with him. All the promises to Israel are fulfilled. Universal peace and justice prevail. So don't give up. It's coming. There's going to be a perfect environment and perfect justice everywhere. In the millennial age, believers from all the nations will worship at a millennial temple in Jerusalem, and Satan is, is restrained, chained up for a thousand years. But at the end of the thousand years, God lets him go to prove something. People can live in a perfect environment. People can live with, with no poisonous anything, with no rebellion. They can live with Jesus himself walking around and seeing him. And they get one whiff of the devil and poof, they're back to their rebellion. And the Lord lets the devil out. I'm in Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 through 9. And the final uprising of mankind occurs, confirming mankind is so depraved that even the presence of Christ on earth before their eyes is not enough to persuade their conversion. So what happens? The Lord just incinerates them all, the unregenerate, and they're resurrected with everybody else. Do you know where the Bible says everybody is that's ever lived on this planet other than the forgiven ones? Do you know where everybody is? They're in Ezekiel 32 in a pit. That's why every time the Lord talks about the lost people, he says they're down. And people struggle with that. They say, down where? As the earth is turning, we're out in space. Where is down? Well, where would down be if you were a school child in the 8th century B.C.? It would be down. It's in the earth. And that's how the Bible describes. There's a pit where every human that's ever lived that's not had their sins forgiven are there today. And it says they're in discomfort and torment and they're conscious. They have perfect memories of their whole life and they're seeing more people come every moment. That place is emptied out, Revelation 20 now. I'm in verse 10. They are standing before Christ's throne. Verse 11, they're sentenced to the eternal punishment their sins have earned. Each of them bows on their knee in front of Jesus Christ, and they say, you are the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, yes, I am. And it's too late for you to have your sins forgiven. In fact, Jesus once said in his ministry, you will die in your sins. That was the worst thing you could say to anybody, to die with your sins because you have to pay for them forever. And each unsaved human plus Satan and his angels are cast in the lake of fire. That's Revelation 20 and verse 15. Well then, the last event, there's a new heaven and new earth, the promise of Emmanuel. Do you remember Christmas? Well, there's so much about Christmas that has to do with Revelation. Do you remember, thou shalt call his name Emmanuel, which being translated is God with us. Finally, that's the fulfillment. God is with us. He appears with us in heaven as fire melts the earth in the universe, 2 Peter 3.10. 
He makes a new world, Revelation 21, 1 to 5. And we as God's servants live in the new Jerusalem described in Revelation 21 and 22 in one of the many rooms prepared for us by Christ, John 14, and we enjoy our Creator and Redeemer forever. Okay? That's a quick thumbnail of the map. But you know, it really doesn't matter right now because all that's going to happen, whether or not we believe it or even participate, God's going to do all that. I want you to look at Revelation 5 with me because I just want to close with this. I want to close with what does matter and I want to be very specific because Revelation was written to show redeemed servants of God how to live, how to live for Christ today as he's on the throne of heaven. What exactly does God consider so important in our lives that God collects what we give him? Have you ever thought about that? Now, I think about that because I collect all the notes my kids write and all the notes my wife writes. In fact, I'm, I'm a real collector. I have boxes of them. I have, I have a table right now where I'm sorting them and I'm reading them again and anything that's good I take a picture of and I'm starting to throw them away, much to my chagrin. I, I don't like to give up any of those sweet little notes they wrote. You all know this. Maybe you've seen your grandparents. Do you remember when, when your grandparents get, get older and weak? I remember this happened to my dad. My dad would sit in his chair. He rarely got out of it, but he had all around him within arm's reach, everything that was really important to him. I mean, he had his, his little basket with magazines and his books and his Bible, and he had a little thing with the remote, and he had a little table with what he needed to drink, and everything important was just around him. Usually, what's most important, we kind of keep right around us, like a little nest. When we go on trips, I remember when Bonnie used to have the eight kids carrying stuff out to the car, we'd be strapping stuff on top. She'd say, oh, oh, Put that in the front seat right at my feet. Because, we don't, you know, stuff can fly off the top. You can lose your suitcase, but we're not going to lose that, you know. It's going to be right at my feet. Have you ever thought, what does God keep right there? Right at his feet. Did you know the Bible says that? It's what, it's what is so important to him. He just wants it right there close all the time. What's important to God? What does he collect from us? Well, look at Revelation 5, and I want to show you in verse 8. Because there's several things we can start doing every day, and here's a summary of what God collects from our lives. God tells us that our worship prayers, now basically I want you to get the idea of this. Anything that we do connected to prayer, worshipful prayers, ministry that is done through prayer, uh, any type of service in Christ's church that's done in prayer, any gifts that are given prayerfully. We're going to go through this whole list. You notice the common denominator is if it's connected to prayer, if it comes and is done in the name of Jesus and sent to God, it's so important to the Lord, it goes right there at his feet. He doesn't let it get out of his presence. It's just he collects it all around him. Number one, our prayers offered in Jesus' name rise to be collected as treasures by God. Look at verse 8 of chapter 5. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense. What does the next part of the 8th verse say? Which are the what? Okay, do you remember? I, I've gone through this for so many weeks. Here's God on his throne. Where are those 24 elders? They're right in front of him. They're circling his feet. They're closest to him. And what do they have in their hands? They have golden bowls full of incense, which are your prayers. You understand God collects them. They're that important to him. Keep going to chapter 8. Look at verse 3 of Revelation. And then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar, verse 3 of chapter 8. And he was given much incense that he should offer it, look at this, with the prayers of the saints upon the altar, the golden altar, which was before the throne. Here again we see this angel comes up with a censer filled with incense and God on the throne gives him some of his collected prayers and that angel on this golden altar mixes the incense and the prayers. God collects our prayers. Look at verse 4. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hands. You see those prayers? You see where they are? They're right in front of God's throne. 
I wonder this morning, what do you have in your bowl of collected prayers? How many has God collected from you? Your moms don't count in your account. Yours. Your dads don't account. Your kids' prayers don't. You, your personal prayers. How, how are you doing? God collects them. You know, if you know someone loves something, you send them even more. I mean, I, I've made the mistake over the years of mentioning things I like. I get too many of them, and so I don't mention them anymore. You know, you don't, you don't want to because people want to respond and give you what you like. You know what God likes? He told us. Prayers. We each need to up our times of prayer. If we just invite God into every bit of our life, every fear, every frustration, our life is revolutionized as we say to the Lord, I want you to be a part of everything. I'm going to, in everything, well, I'm going to pray, pray without ceasing. Uh, apart from you, I can do nothing, so I want you to be a part. I'm going to pray about it. That attaches everything we do in life, whether therefore you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all the glory of God. How do you do that? By attaching it, being done in Jesus' name. Now, it is a limiting thing. Are there things in your life that you cannot say, I'm doing this in Jesus' name. You know, I'm going to go to that party on Friday night, and I'm going to go, and they're going to pour vodka on that sugar cube, and I'm going to lick it off there until I'm going crazy and do all kinds of awful stuff. And I'm going to do that. I mean, can you really do that in Jesus' name? Not if you're Christian. See, there are, it limits our lives. But anything we do in Jesus' name, he collects. That's not all he collects. Let me show you just a few more. We have just enough time to show you a couple. Look back at Mark chapter 12. I want to do these rapidly. Um, we're going to look at these in depth as we study a biblical theology of worship, but I just want to get you started. Mark 12, 33. Secondly, our devotional love for God is more important to him than all the Old Testament sacrifices ever offered on any altar. Matthew 12, 33. He treasures our sacrificial, devotional love for him. Look what it says. Uh, someone asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? Look at verse 33. He says, and to love him with all the heart and all the understanding, with all the soul, and with all the strength, with all the love, one's neighbor is myself, is more than the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. You know what Jesus said? Loving him more than anything else. And declaring that is so special. Remember, those offerings on the altar, when they burnt those animals, the smoke would rise, and God says that, that he smelled it and it was beautiful in his sight. It doesn't say he collected it. But you know what he collects? When we say, Lord, I love you with every ounce of my being. I love you, Lord, like David said in Psalm 18 and verse 1. I love you, O Lord, my strength. God is into collecting that. I wonder this morning, have we offered our devotion up to him? Have we given him each day our love, our complete attention? Have we focused upon him in his word and prayer? Look at uh, chapter 12 of Romans. Here's another one that uh, sometimes we overlook. You already know what's in Romans 12, 1. Our lives a living sacrifice. What we miss is the very last word of verse 1. Because that word says that the offering of ourselves as a living sacrifice is an act of worship. And God collects acts of worship. Look what Romans 12, 1 says. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. That means an everyday sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. Now look at this. Which is your, and the next word in Greek, is a form of liturgos. It's our spiritual service to the Lord, our offering of worship. Did you catch what that said? A living sacrifice is not a one-time sacrifice that is burnt up and it's done. It's an everyday, renewed, surrender sacrifice. Do you know what this means? Do you want to know what God would collect? Every time you and I renew our surrender of our life and body to him, now a lot of people say, oh, yeah, I, at camp, at a campfire, yeah, when I was eight, I did that. I've met people, I say, you know, we're going to have a little service, we're all going to, you know, dedicate. Oh, no, I've already done that. I did that. I said, well, but the Bible says you're supposed to do it every day. It's a living. It's a, it's a daily renewed sacrifice of ourself to God. You know, this morning, and, and I, I'll just read you the rest of them. 
The Bible says that when you serve in Christ's church, you offer a worship that God notes and treasures. The Bible says that every time we give a gift in Jesus' name, that goes right in front of him in that bowl. Every time we offer praise songs and worship in Jesus' name, God treasures it. And every time we secretly offer a deed of kindness and a good deed in Christ's name, he treasures it. But you know what? Let's just go back to the first three we looked at. Every time we pray, it's so important if it's in Christ's name. That's why I said pray in my name. He keeps it. Every time we are those who say we love you with all of our heart, he keeps that. He, it's a love note. It's like a Valentine heart. In fact, I have two years ago's Valentine still pasted on my mirror in the bathroom. I love them from the kids and Bonnie. Can you imagine how many God has? He collects every time you said you love him. And then he says, what I want you to do is, I want you to renew that surrender to me. So, this is how we're going to close. Let's all stand. And as you stand, I'm going to close in prayer, but this is what I want you to do. I want you to think, how long has it been since you said, Lord, I love you more than anything else. I love you more than anything in my life. How long has it been since you said, Lord, I want to pray. I want everything in my life to be connected to you. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to do it if I can't say I'm doing this in Jesus' name. You know, in Jesus' name, I'm going to go blast to bits and get blood all over the screen, even though Jesus hates gratuitous bloodshed. In Jesus' name, I'm going to go to that movie and watch a whole bunch of, of unclothed people committing fornication and adultery. I, I don't think he would like that. I'm going to go to the movie with all the, the occult stuff in it that you hate, okay? I'm going to do that in Jesus' name. See, it, it, if, you, if you live this life of prayer, it's very limiting. You, you can't, in Jesus' name, Paul said, get drunk. That's 1 Corinthians 11. See, it's limiting. But you know what? It sure does rack up a lot of love gifts to Christ before his throne. So, you might want to just, as we pray this morning, instead of just going out of here, you might want to just pause and say, Lord, I want to just renew my living sacrifice status with you. I just want to renew that you bought me and you own me. It's been kind of a while since I reminded myself of that, and so I want to live as a sacrifice for you today. Just a thought. Now let me just give you one PS to that. Tonight, Jesus wants to have dinner with you. He's invited you to supper. He has, it says in the Bible, the Lord's Supper. He comes and sits on one side of the table and he wants you to be on the other side. Did you know that's what communion is? Did you know we only do that twice a month? Did you know Jesus will be here? And he gathers with his church for the celebration of communion. We're going to have baptism. We're going to have people, a young lady declaring her faith in Christ and following him. We're going to have a wonderful, encouraging time. Did you know if you say, Lord, I want to renew my surrender to you, he might say, good. What's more important? What's more important on this planet than having supper with me? And then you might have to make a choice. See, that's how life changes when we surrender. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the book of Revelation, for the map that shows us what's important to you, what you're going to do, and how we're a part of that. And we just want to make our lives lives of prayer. We want to make our lives lives of devotion and loving you. And we want to renew this very moment that you bought us and we want to be a living sacrifice as our gift back to you of consecration. And Father, for anybody that needs to talk to someone this morning as the godly men and women, the elders and Titus two women come, I pray that you just help um, those who need counsel and prayer to be ministered to, but for most of us, may we just pause and renew our love for you. And we'll thank you for what you do in our lives and what you collect as a treasure from us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all of God's people said, amen.